Good morning, Temple. Man, how many is glad to be here this morning? All right, we want to invite you to stand with us today. Let me hear you help us sing, church. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Oh, let me hear you, church. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Oh, let's sing it together, church. For God so loved the world that he gave us.
you're working hard in the precious blood. Oh, sing it for us one more time. Oh, there is power, 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 one you're working hard in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, there is power, 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 one you're working hard in the precious blood of the Lamb. It's in the precious blood. You can be seated this morning, church.
would you stand with us again this morning? I'm glad that we serve a risen, living, and a faithful Savior this morning. So let's all sing out this morning. Help us out. Jesus came and loved me. He took my sin to Calvary. He has made a way for me. Now my eyes are open since I've come to know him. His great love has set me free. At the cross, my dead was paid. All my sins were washed away. Just for me, amazing grace. At the cross. Sing it, church. Jesus came and loved me. He took my sin to Calvary. He has made a way for me. And now my eyes are open. Since I've come to know him, his great love has set me free.
ahead and have a seat and go ahead and have a seat John chapter 4 this is the, 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 the scene of the woman at the well are you familiar yeah. all right you're familiar we've, we've talked about this before but in John chapter 4 I'm going to start in verse 1 and we'll read uh, down to verse 29 there's a lot of verses and and there's a lot of details but hopefully we'll be able to get through it today and, and maybe learn something a little different Starting in verse 1, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had uh, made, I'm sorry, the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left for Judea and departed again into Galilee. See, Jesus was not wanting to make a scene right now, so he just thought he would exit out quietly. So that's why he's, he's making an exit, he's going to the Galilee. Verse 4, and he must needs go through Samaria. This is an important verse. So circle it, highlight it, whatever you want to do. But this is an important verse on verse 4. He must needs go through Samaria. Verse 5, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey. Aren't you glad that he, he can relate to our tiredness? That sometimes he can go through stuff, and every now and then he just gets a little tired and needs to sit down. I, I'm glad the scripture puts these kind of details in there. Let us know that he can relate to our humanity. And it says that he was wearied from his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, which was about noon, middle of the day. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Can you imagine the very first? He didn't say, Hey, my name is Jesus. What is your name? He didn't introduce himself or nothing. This woman shows up and says, Give me to drink. I don't know. I thought it was interesting. All right. Verse 8. For Jesus, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Verse 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. That's an important phrase right there. The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it was that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto her, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. Where is your bucket? And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But, so, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor in at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, 
When the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that the Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee, what is he saying? Am he. Surprise! <laughs> He's here. Verse 27. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? I love this. I love this because there's a lot of information, a lot of details, and a lot of historical importance to this city, to this well, and to this situation. And, and Lord willing, I help us unpack some of this and give us some meaning and depth to what's going on. But what I have realized as a case study of humanity is we're the kind of people who don't like conflict. We don't like uncomfortable situations. We don't like awkwardness. Some of you are so timid and so introverted that if you go out to eat and you order a steak and instead of french fries you want mashed potatoes and the waitress comes to your table and you have a steak and french fries, knowing good and well you said you wanted mashed potatoes, you just look at it and say, thank you. Like you won't even say, take it back. Or I, you, you're, just, you're just so afraid of confrontation, so afraid of the uncomfortable, so afraid of, of saying something that might be a little conflicting. You know, you're like, I don't want to engage in this. We are the kind of people that avoid uncomfortable situations. Would you agree? Yeah. I think in majority, we, we are the kind of people that we avoid pain. See, let me tell you a little bit about Samaria. Samaria was a place that the Jewish people would have tried to avoid their entire life. They would not try to go through Samaria. If, if you look at a map, Samaria is slap dab in the middle from, from Judea to Galilee. Samaria is right in the middle. And the quickest route to get there, this is something else, but we'll get to there. The quickest route to get to, Samar uh, to, to Galilee from Judea is to go straight through Samaria. Now, that's about a 70-mile journey. That's a three-day journey if you used to walk it. But the Jews had such a, a prejudice against the Samaritan people that they would go around Samaria, which would add to their total, they would go 130 miles just so they didn't have to go through Samaria. That's how much prejudice that they had against these people. This is how much they did, tried to avoid these people. Now, this picture he flashed up here on, on the wall just a second ago, this is kind of my own understanding of Samaria. Growing up in South Alabama, I grew up in a city called Theodore, and I, went to a, I lived in a community called Hollinger's Island. Now, in our little community, from one road to the other, there was a cut-through road called San Marino. Now, you can throw that picture back up there. San Marino is the quickest way. See that red line? You all see that red line? That's San Marino. See that blue line that goes all the way down there to the bottom? That's where I live, right there at the bottom. And so if you're coming down where that yellow line is, you can cut through and come on down to my house. But sometimes you'd go around the long way because San Marino was sketchy. <laughs> sketchy people lived on San Marino. If you go down San Marino, they would cut you. I ain't going to lie. They were, they were a little gangster down San Marino. They, they didn't, they didn't do, always do right. So my mama would all the times go around San Marino instead of cutting through. San Marino was the quickest route. But we avoided San Marino. And it was for good reason. I remember when I was in high school, I had an old beat-up Jeep Cherokee, 1986. The passenger side door was so bent in, you couldn't even use the door. I, I inherited that way. I didn't do it. And it was just beat up to pieces, but it got me from point A to point B. And I remember one day coming home from school, and I was going to cut down San Marino. And so I started driving down San Marino, and wouldn't you know it, the Rook boys were out in the middle of the road. Now, you don't know the Rook boys, but the Rook boys were never up to anything good. All right, the Rook boys, they were not going to come to your door and try to sell you Girl Scout cookies. All right, they, they were not that kind of people. And the oldest Rook boy was trying to make me stop in the middle of the road, and I saw the other Rook boys standing on the side. I said, this don't look good. And I already got dents in my car, so what's one more? So I just floored it and hit them, all right? And so here's the thing. I didn't, I, he was okay. I watched him in my rearview mirror. He got up. He was fine. But I just punched it and went, all right? And I got home, and I didn't go down San Marino much more after that. But I know what it's like to go through places you try to avoid. Now, here's the truth about following Jesus, because Jesus had 12 people, 12 disciples following him. What, what ethnicity were these 12 men? Jewish people. 
And in verse 4, he says he must needs go through Samaria. So here's the truth about following Jesus. When you follow Jesus, he will bring you through situations that you've been trying to avoid your whole life. And so they try, they, they've been trying to avoid Samaria and these people their whole life. And Jesus says, I have to go through Samaria. Let's go. And so they send him. Jesus gets there and he sends the disciples into town. He says, I need you to get me a sandwich. I'm hungry. Go get me something to eat. Now, not only are they going through a town they've tried to avoid, now they have to go talk to people they've been trying to avoid their whole life. And they come back from this errand, and they find Jesus alone sitting with this woman, but not just a woman, a Samaritan woman, not just a Samaritan woman, but a Samaritan woman with a promiscuous reputation. And, 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 and this was very unconventional for Jesus to be a Jewish person, to be sitting alone with a woman, period. Matter of fact, the rabbis teach today that if you're going to be alone with a woman, it must be first of kin. It must be your wife, your daughter, or your sister. But what I love about Jesus is he's not much for convention and social norms and tradition. He likes to flip those things upside down. He'll obey the laws and the rules, but he, he don't care much for tradition. And so here he is sitting alone with this woman, talking to her. And he's having this conversation with her that is so deep and so personal. And I think would benefit us today. So what I want to do is I want to go deeper into this conversation, if you allow me. And I want to see what he's talking about to this woman. And so number one, if you're taking notes, what we see is that Jesus has a way of making things have meaning. And so he enhances the well. Jesus enhances the well. Let me tell you a little history about this location. He's in a city called Shechem. In, 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 in John chapter 4, it's called Sychar. But Shechem and Sychar are the same place. Does that make sense? So I'm going to use that interchangeably. Just know I'm talking about the same place. Shechem and Sychar is kind of it's the same location. And Shechem has a rich history in Israel. It is in this place where Abraham built an altar to the Lord. It is here where Abraham and Sarah gave birth to Isaac. Isaac and Rebekah would eventually have a child, two children, twins, Jacob and Esau. Jacob known as the trickster. Esau known as the red hairy one. Read your Bible, it's there. Can you imagine giving birth to a red, hairy child? You'd love him anyways. And then Jacob, being the trickster that he was, he scammed his brother Esau out of his birthright, his, his inheritance. And he took off and started moving and lived with the people of the east. There he fell in love with a woman named Rachel, and he loved Rachel, for love at first sight. And so he talked to Rachel's daddy, he says, I want to marry your daughter. He says, well, work for me for seven years, you can have her. He worked for seven years, and the trickster got tricked. At the wedding day, after everything was said and done, he, 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 he realized he had married the wrong daughter. He had married Leah. Now he's upset about this. Goes back to the dad and says, you tricked me. He says, well, if you want the other one, you have to work another seven years. So he works another seven years. Now he has Rachel. Now Rachel and, and, and Jacob, they have a boy named Joseph. And Joseph has a dream. And in his dream, all his brothers are going to bow down to him. He's going to be the greatest of all the brothers. Now how do you think the brothers like that dream? They didn't like it very much. So they take him to the prairie lands, to, the, to the, the lands of Shechem, and they throw him into a pit. And they sell him into slavery. This is where Joseph's destiny began. It is in Shechem. It lies between, I got a picture of this. I have a, a picture of these two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Now right in the middle of these two mountains is the city of Shechem. And so it, 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 this is an amazing place. On one mountain, this is where uh, Moses commanded the people. He split the tribes up. He put half the tribe on Mount Gerizim. He put the other half of the tribe on Mount Ebal. He, on Mount Gerizim, he says, I want you to talk about the promises of God. When you follow God and obey God in the promised land, this is what God's going to do for you. Over here on Mount Ebal, he says, I want you all to recite the curses of God. When you disobey God and you don't do right, this is what God's going to do for you. And this was a way that, God, that Moses was commanding the people before they go into the promised land how they were going to conduct themselves. This happened in Shechem. And then towards the end of his life, Joshua is now the commander, the military leader of Israel. Towards the end of his life, he calls all the people of Israel together in Shechem. And he gives them his final address and final words about what he's about to do before he leaves out. And then Joshua and the people of Israel go and conquer the promised land. After they conquer the promised land, they take Joseph's bones. Joseph's dead and gone, but his bones are buried in Egypt. So they go and retrieve the bones of Joseph, bring them back to Shechem, and there's a tomb to this day with, with Joseph's bones there in Shechem. And then all... All of this comes up to a point in John chapter 4 where Jesus has happened to be in Shechem talking to a Samaritan woman. All of this history behind him. All of the promises and covenants of Israel. All the things that took place before this moment is all behind him. And it's like an arrow pointing at Jesus. 
I don't know if you understand this, but when you read the Old Testament, it's just foreshadowing the coming of Christ. And so everything the Old Testament was promising and talking about, now here's Jesus at this well in this holy land, in this location, in this rich history of a location. And here's what Jesus can do, and only Jesus can do this, is he's able, because history, if you read the Old Testament, Israel's history was not always rainbows and unicorns. They, 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 were, they were idol, idol worshippers. They were people who forsook God. They were people who married other nationalities, and they started worshiping those gods. They had a very, very tragic history at times. But what Jesus can do is he can wrap his arms around the horrible and the holy at the same time. And what Jesus can do is he can wrap his arms around the garbage and the good at the same time. And I love it because that means he can do it for you too. He can come to your life and he can wrap around everything that's good and everything that's bad and he can give it meaning. He can give it purpose. And so here's this arrow pointing at Jesus in the middle of Shechem. And this is a huge lesson for us because all of history is pointing to this moment that he's having a conversation with this woman. And this woman, he's saying, can you give me something to drink? And she says, you don't even have anything to drink with. Are you, even, are you, are you greater than our father Jacob? She has no idea who she's talking to. This is the walking word. This is God in the flesh. All of her, her father Jacob was preparing the way for this man right here named Jesus. Amen. Abraham, the promise that was given to him through you, all nations will be blessed. Guess what? He is there. That's the blessing to all nations right there, Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is the culmination and, and the tangible evidence of all the prophecy of the Old Testament. And she's talking to him right now, and she don't even know it. In this historical setting, she don't even know. And Jesus is able to take a conversation about a well and make it something bigger. She says, give, give me the, he said, give me something to drink. And then she says, well, you don't have anything to drink with. And he says, well, if you would have asked me, I would have gave you living water. Amen. Now, let me help you understand what this is. Jesus has a way of taking conversations from the lower, lesser, and lighter to the heavier, higher, and holier. Yeah. Think about it when he goes to call his disciples. He sees them fishing. He says, I see that you're a fisherman. How about you follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He goes from the lesser, lighter, and lower to the heavier, higher, and holier. This is what Jesus does constantly. He's able to take a normal conversation, find a way to segue it into a gospel conversation. Jesus was the model for this. We can look at his conversations time and time again and see how he's able to take a normal conversation. He's just talking about water. And now all of a sudden he's talking about salvation. I think about a conversation I had with a young man the other day in the sauna at Coleman Aquatic Center. I get a little weird in the sauna because... It's just a small little closet that's about 180 degrees. You're just in there sweating to death. And another guy walks in, and it's just two dudes shirtless in a sauna. You know, I'm going to break the ice. I'm not going to just stare at them, you know. So I'm, I engage him, and I notice he has tattoos on him. And so I, I, I say, man, I like your tattoos. And he had one on his arm. It was Star Wars. I said, tell me about that one. He said, oh, it's, Star, it's got a Death Star on it. It's got lightsabers. I'm like, that's pretty cool. I like that one. Hey, I said, what about the other one? He explained the other one. And on his back, he had a cross. I said, what, that, what does that one mean? He said, that's a Celtic cross. I'm, I'm from Irish descent. I said, cool. And some of y'all don't know this, but I got tattoos too. Now, don't get up and walk out, okay? <laughs> we'll be okay. We'll be okay, Fairview. We'll be all right. And uh, I have one on the back of my leg. It's called the noon symbol. Now, what this is, about 10, 11 years ago, when Israel was being persecuted by ISIS. They, people from ISIS would go and, and spray paint this symbol on all the businesses and homes of the people that lived there. It was called the noon symbol. It's the Arabic letter N because they would call the Christians Nazarenes. And so anywhere there was a Christian community or Christian person, they would spray paint this symbol on the building. And so kind of in my own way, in the act of solidarity with my Christian brothers and sisters over in the Middle East, I put that symbol on my body. And I began to share that with this young man. And then I said, do you have a moment I'll have to tell you my story? And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm able to engage this guy in a sauna about my story. Now, we went from the lower, lesser, and lighter to the heavier, higher, and holier, didn't we? And it started about a tattoo. Yeah. And this is what Jesus does. He's, he's able to take a conversation and transition it into something and give it meaning. So he enhances the will. And then secondly, he engages the woman. Now he's having a conversation with this woman. She says, you don't even have a bucket she has no idea who she's talking to. In John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. You know what he's saying? The very molecules that make up the water, Jesus spoke it into existence. The very clay and the dirt that made that well, Jesus put it into existence. And she's saying, you don't have a bucket. He's saying, lady, I made the water. You know? 
You don't even know who you're talking to. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12, Isaiah says, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out the heaven with a span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in the scales, and the hills in the balance? You know what Isaiah is saying? He says, Our God is so big, he can fit all the waters of the world in the hollow of his hand. He can stretch out his arms, and he can touch from one side of the universe to the other side of the universe. Our God is big and powerful. And she's saying, You don't have a bucket. But you know what? Jesus don't get offended. He, he don't get disturbed by this. And he just kindly responds. He says, well, if you come to this well to drink, you will come again. And in verse 14, we find the heart of the passage. It says, but whosoever drinketh of the water. Now, I want you all to underline this, circle this. He says, whoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him. I shall give him. This water is not earned. This gift is not something you can muster up in yourself. You can't be good enough to receive this. Jesus says, I shall give it. This is something important that we need to notice here. He says, I shall give him, shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The imagery here is that it never runs out. It is constantly overflowing. It is just constantly bubbling. It is a spring of everlasting life. He's talking about an eternity here. He's talking about salvation here. He says, if you partake of the water that I'll give you, you will never go thirsty. Your soul would never be thirsty again. It would always be satisfied. See, Jesus likes to give in abundance. I don't know if you picked that up yet or not, but he loves to give in abundance. I think about Jesus. He's talking to Peter. He says, Peter, did you catch any fish? He says, no, we've been fishing all night. Didn't catch anything. He says, let's go again. And so they go out again, and they drop the nets off on the other side. Now, it would have been enough for Jesus to allow the net to get a little full, wouldn't it? That would have proved his point. But instead, what happens is the net gets so full, it about sinks the boat. Peter's having to signal the other boat to come and help him. And they're able to wrestle this, this net up to the top and get it to the shore. See, it wasn't enough that Jesus just filled it a little bit. He filled it to the brim. Jesus likes to give in abundance. I think about Jesus on a hillside with 5,000 men. Now, if we believe there's women and children there, it's probably 10 to 12,000 people on this hillside. He takes a little boy's lunch, breaks it and blesses it, and begins to distribute it. The Bible tells us that it wasn't enough that they just had a little bit. Everybody has a little bit. It says they ate until they were full. And then after that, they go and collect the leftovers. And what they have, they have 12 baskets of leftovers. See, Jesus likes to give abundantly. I think about the demon-possessed man in Gennesaret where he is living amongst the tombs. The people are scared to death of him. They're chaining him up, and he keeps breaking the chains. He's naked, and he's crazy. And Jesus approaches this demon-possessed man and says, Demon, what is your name? He says, My name is Legion, for we are many. Scholars believe this man may have thousands of demons possessing him. It's not enough that Jesus made him a little bit better. It says by the time Jesus was done with him, he was clothed and in his right mind, sitting at the fire ready to join the missionary team of Jesus. And Jesus says, Hey, you can't go with me. I need you to go back home tell your friends and family what I've done for you. Jesus loves to give in abundance. And he's telling this woman, if you would just ask of me what I'd be willing to give for you, it would do. Jesus has a way of loving us in abundance. And so in verse 15, the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She's like, I don't want to make this journey no more. Give me that water you're talking about. This is what he wanted, isn't it? This is the yes. She is laying her yes on the table. She's saying, what are you offering? I want that. Yes, give it to me. This is the time in church that we'd invite Brother Jalen to come up here and sing, and he would start singing, no matter why you, whatever song it is. All right, and then he would begin to sing, and all of a sudden we'd say, okay, we got ladies for ladies, men for men up here, altar workers. And then, and then Miss Cindy Reese would take this lady by the hand and, and fill out a little form for her. And, and then all of a sudden we would, we would take that form and input her information. Miss Belisa would follow up for her and she'd be serving coffee in the common grounds by next Sunday. That's, right. That's what we would do, right? She's saying, yes, give it to me. Whatever you got, I want that. That's the yes. I'm putting my yes on the table. But then Jesus does something weird. He makes the conversation awkward. Look what he says. Number three, he examines the wound. He examines the wound. Verse 16. Yes, I want that water. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. Ooh. Can you imagine her countenance just changing? Hmm. She went from a lighthearted conversation. Now things have gotten a little serious. Have you ever done something you thought you got away with and all of a sudden you realize you didn't get away with it? 
I don't know if that's anybody in here has ever done anything like that. You thought you got scot-free, you didn't get caught, and all of a sudden you get caught. I remember when I was a kid, me and my older brother were trying to keep out my younger brother. And it's like what the brothers do, isn't it? And so we're in the bedroom, and we're against the door, and my younger brother's on the other side just pounding the door. Bang, bang. And we have a chair in the room. And we took the chair, we put it on his back, and we slid it against the door and kind of wedged it in between kind of like this half wall in the door. Well, we walk away from the door. My brother keeps hitting the door. And he finally hit it hard enough that one of the chair legs went through the door. It's one of those hollow core doors, you know what I'm talking about? It was a dark brown hollow core door, and he put a hole in it about that big around. And we panicked. And I was like, we got to do something. So we pulled the, door, the, 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 the chair out of the door, and, and, and we come up with a plan. I come up with a plan because I'm the genius in this. And I got a piece of paper, and I cut it about the same size of that hole, and I got different shades of brown, and I colored wood grain on this piece of paper. And I got that piece of paper, and I taped it over that hole. And we, it looked good. From a distance, you couldn't tell. You, you couldn't tell from a distance. It looked good. It was persuasive. And then... About a week or so later, we had forgotten about it. About a week or so later, me and my older brother are sitting at the dining room, uh, uh, at the kitchen counter, I should say, eating our cereal for the morning. And we look up on the refrigerator, and under a magnet is that piece of paper. <laughs> we were busted. I lost my appetite. I didn't want to eat breakfast no more. I know we had been found out. It's a terrible feeling. And I imagine this is how this woman feels. She she had been through some stuff, and all of a sudden now he's saying, go get your husband. Can I just say this, that everybody in here, we live in a broken world. And nobody gets out of this world without being affected by some kind of sin or brokenness. We've all been touched with sin and brokenness. We all experience significant wounding in our lives. Sometimes it's self-inflicted wounding. Sometimes it's the wounding, the wounding of other people acted upon us. And because of that, we carry around shame and regret and guilt. And some of us build emotional walls because we are afraid of getting wounded again. And so we have this burden on us. And, 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 and this is something this woman is dealing with at this moment. And she's being called out about it. We have this one area of our life that we don't want anybody to know about. Constantine was a Roman emperor the first Christian Roman emperor, and by force he made others become Christian too. Not a great evangelistic strategy, but that's how he did it. He forced you to become a Christian. Now he would baptize all of his soldiers. The soldiers, when they were being baptized, would hold their sword out of the water, symbolizing God can have all of me, but this is mine. And I feel like that's how some of us are. God, you can have all of me, but this right here is mine. This 1%, this is my thing. And I think everybody has that one thing, that's something that they're still holding on to that keeps coming up in their life. And here's the difference between a scar and a wound. You can touch a scar without pain, but when you touch a wound, there's pain. And what Jesus is doing right now is he's trying to touch the deepest wound of this woman's heart. He's trying to get her ready to receive the living water that he had just offered her previously. Look at the line of argument. Look what he's saying. It says, I, she says, I want that stream of living water you're offering. Jesus says, great. Well, the path to get it is to go get your husband. Mm. Can you imagine a woman's face as she says, sir, I, 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 don't, I don't have a husband. And then Jesus drops the truth bomb right in her lap. You said right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with right now isn't even your husband. Why would Jesus bring this up? She was already saying yes. Why would she bring this? Why would he have this awkward conversation right now? Why? Here's why. Because God comes after us not in our goodness but in our brokenness. Where God is going to come after you is not in how good you are but how you don't have it all together. In our politically correct world, everybody would read this and think, well, that's, that's unfair for him to say something like that. Here's the thing. He's only speaking truth. And we've come to a place in our world that believe truth is, is, is some kind of judgment. I work out at Planet Fitness every now and then. You know what they don't have at Planet Fitness? A scale. You know why? Because their motto is, we are a judgment-free zone. And so in their estimation of things, a scale is judgmental. You know what a scale does? A scale tells you the truth about yourself. If I step on that scale and I see more numbers on that scale than it's in my bank account, we have problems. 
All right? That scale is only revealing to me what the problem is. It's telling me the facts about myself, right? Would you agree? And so what God does, see, here's what the scale does. When I step on a scale and I see that number, it motivates me. I said, well, I need to do something about that. I need to do some changing. I need to, I need to change my habits. I need to correct that. I need, so the, the truth of the scale puts action into me. And so God, in his word, this is what Jesus is doing. He's saying some hard things. He's saying some truthful things. But the reason why he's doing that is, is because the most loving thing you can do to somebody is telling the truth. We have come to the realization and, and this, this, this skew of things that we believe that withholding information is love. Withholding truth is not love. Withholding truth is hate. If you don't tell somebody what is true, you don't love them, you're hating them. To tell them the truth is to love them, even when it hurts. And so what Jesus is doing is he exposes the sin in her life so that she sees the need for a change. Because this is a habitual behavior in her life. She's got five ex-husbands and living with a man that's not even her husband. This is something she's been trying to do to satisfy the thirst of her soul her whole life. And he's pinpointing and says, lady, you've got a problem. And I want to help you. And so you must understand it is in our sin that he meets us, not in our achievements. The gospel has never been, Jesus found me at my best. Anybody's testimony in here, Jesus found me at my best? No, the testimony usually is, Jesus found me at my most broken. Jesus found me when I was in my greatest need. Jesus found me when I was in my, mess, my most messed up. Jesus found me at the end of my rope. That's when Jesus encounters you. Why? Because that's when you get to the place that you see a need for him. And so she didn't quite see the need yet. You see what I'm saying? And so he's saying to her, go get your husband. I don't have a husband. That's right. You've had five husbands. The man you're living with now is not even your husband. All of a sudden, she's realizing, ooh, I'm in trouble. I'm broken. I've got a problem. There's two great revelations in Christianity. There's the revelation of God and the revelation of ourselves. Now, here's the thing. You will never really tru truly see yourself until you truly see God. And when you see God... In all of his glory and all of his pureness and perfection, when you see God and you see yourself against God, you'll be appalled at what you see in yourself. When you see God the way he is and then you look at yourself, it'll make you want to do something about it. It'll make you want to change. So the gospel is not God found me at my best. The gospel is God found me at my worst. Jesus wants for you to have streams of living water bursting forth in eternal life and come out of the deepest part of your life. That is the offer. That is what he's come to offer you. And so there's going to be a reaction to that because he's got to touch some wounds. He's going to have to touch some wounds. And our reaction to being touched by our wounds being touched is that we're going to redirect, we're going to react, or we're going to retaliate. I had a dog that hurt its leg recently, and I was just trying to pick her up. And, and, and when I picked her up, I, I hurt her leg a, a little bit, too. And she reached back, and she bit my arm. Now, she didn't bite it hard enough to draw blood, but she bit it enough to let me know that hurt. Yeah. And sometimes when you get a wound touch, you kind of retaliate a little bit. Look what this woman does. This woman uses the redirect. He touches the wound, and then she says, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then she starts using this highly controversial theological conversation of the day to try to get him off the trail of her behavior. Yeah. So our people say it's this mountain, your people say it's this mountain, so which mountain is the best mountain? You, know, you see what she's doing? I don't want to talk about this no more. Yeah. Let's talk about something else. She's redirecting the conversation. Let's talk about something different. Yeah. I, I, I've been in Baptist circles most of my life, and, and one thing Baptists like to do is eat. We love, we love potlucks. We love, I used to go to revival meetings and camp meetings and everything else, and we'd have, boy, we'd have buffets of food, let me tell you. So much good food. And then after that, you would see the world's largest man get up there and preach. And here's the thing. <laughs> he would get up there and he'd preach about all kind of hot-button topics of the day. He'd talk about homosexuality, promiscuity. He'd talk about the King James Bible. He'd talk about how contemporary music is the devil. He would talk about all these things that would get him amens. But I've never seen a big man like that talk about moderation or gluttony. Why? It's the redirect. I'm going to talk about something that's not about me. I, I, shared, I shared the gospel with a, a young man not long ago, and I, I basically asked him a question. And he says, yes, I believe there is a God. I said, okay, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? You know what his response was? 
well, the Dead Sea Scrolls are about this, and there's all these other manuscripts that aren't included in the Bible, and, and if you know this about this person, I said, that's not the question. You know what he was doing? The redirect. Let's talk about something else. And so Jesus doesn't get disturbed by it, because here's the reality. Doesn't a doctor have to touch the wound to heal it? And so he don't, he don't get scared. And then he takes time, to, number, number four, explain true worship. He takes some time to talk to her. Verses 21 through 26 take a whole change of events. Jesus hears her question and basically says, yeah, I hear what you're saying. She's, she's kind of confused about the mountains. Which mountain is best? See, the Samaritans, let me give you a little background about Samaritan people. The Samaritans would worship all kinds of God, not just, not just Yahweh God. They worship all kinds of gods. But they would worship the one true God, too, because they didn't want to leave them out just in case. And, and they believed, they were taught wrongly, but they believed that Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac on Mount Gerizim. And they taught that Melchizedek had appeared to Abraham at Mount Gerizim. And they believed that it was on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, where Moses had erected an altar to uh, make a sacrifice to God when they entered into the promised land. They were taught in their upbringing that Mount Gerizim was the most sacred place in the world. Mount Gerizim is right there next to Shechem, right there in the middle of Samaria. And so they believed that their mountain was the most holy mountain, and they believed wrong. Because all that happened on Mount Moriah. But Jesus didn't go through all that. He didn't try to explain all that. Here's one thing I've learned. I've never argued anyone to Jesus. Have you ever argued anyone to Jesus? I have argued with people and won the argument and lost the person. That is not a win. Jesus was not here to debate with her. But if you look at the real heart of what she's asking, it's this. She sees the brokenness. She sees her sin. He's put his finger on the wound in her life. She realizes she's wrong. And the question she's basically asking, even though it is a bit of a redirect, she's asking this question. She's saying, basically, all I knew to do when I, when I sin is to go make a sacrifice. And I don't know which mountain to go sacrifice on. Is it this mountain or this mountain? I just want to know, where can I find God? That's the question she's basically asking. I want to get right. So where do I need to go to find God? And Jesus responds in love. And he says, you know what? The argument's over. It don't matter which mountain you go to. Because now is a time when true worshipers will find God in spirit and in truth. In other words, you can worship him anywhere, everywhere, anytime. He is approachable. He's not confined to this mountain. He's not confined to this mountain. He's not confined to these people. He is available to you right now. Well, that's good news. And in John, if you read John, there's a bunch of I am statements. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the son of God. I am the son of man. There's all these I am statements in which he's identifying himself as God. This, in verse 26, is the very first I am statement in all of the gospel of John. <laughs> and who gets it? A three-time loser. A woman, a Samaritan woman, and a Samaritan woman with a reputation. Because in that culture, women didn't have a whole lot of preference. But Jesus gives the first I am statement. She says, well, when the Messiah comes, he will sort all things out. And in verse 26, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto, them, uh, unto thee am he. I am he. The first I am statement wasn't given the previous chapter when he was talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a religious ruler of the day. Jesus didn't give an I am statement to Nicodemus. Jesus didn't give an I am statement to his 12 disciples who had forsaken everything to follow him. The very first person to get an I am statement from, in the Gospel of John is this woman. You know why? Here's why I believe this is. Because Jesus wanted to love the world not just in theory but in action. You can see it right here. He comes close to those who are far from him. And I can imagine this woman saying, well, listen, what about my past? And he says, well, listen... I told you about your past. I know everything about you. The offer's still on the table. What about my present? Because think about this. Did she go move out of home dude's house yet? Did she go pack her bags yet? Did she break up with the guy? Offer's still on the table, isn't it? You want living water? I'll give it to you right now. But don't you know what I've done? Yeah, I've told you what you've done. Offer's still on the table. <laughs> I... I, I <laughs> She said, I, I can't believe it. See, we, sometimes we think that we have to go clean up first before we invite Jesus in. That's, right. That's wrong. Jesus says, I want you like you are. 
See, he loves you enough to bring you in like you are, but he loves you too much to leave you like you are. And so there is the expectation you will change, but he wants you right now as you are. He didn't say, okay, go move out of your dude's house, go get you another rental, go get you a job, go get a steady income. After you do all that, let's come back, let's talk about this. No, he says, hey, you want living water? I'll give it to you right now. I've got five husbands. I know you had five husbands. I'm living with a guy right now. I know you are. You want living water? Water that will satisfy the thirst of your soul? You can have it right now. You want it? You know what she does? You know what her reaction is? Woo! You know what she does? Listen. She gets up. In verse 28, the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the man, to the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? You know what she does? See, that water pot is a symbol of her burden, her shame, and her sin. Because this well, Jacob's well, was over half a mile outside of her city. There were other wells that were closer to her village. And there are better times of day to go to the well other than middle of the day, noon, in a desert. Who wants to carry a pot of water in the middle of the day in a desert? But you know why she did this? She went to the furthest well at the hottest part of the day because she didn't want to be seen by nobody. Her sin had made her an outcast. Her sin has, has ostracized her and kept her out of public eye for so long. And now for the first time ever, she has met a man who's not afraid of the skeletons of her past or the ugliness of her present and says to her, I'll take you like you are. I'll give you living water to satisfy the thirst of your soul. You don't have to keep jumping around from man to man to man. I will satisfy the thirst of your soul if you just partake of what I have to offer. And for the first time ever, her soul was filled and satisfied that she didn't need a water pot no more because she walked away with a whole well. And she went back to the village and says, you need to come see a man who told me everything about me and still loved me all the same. Isn't that what Romans chapter 5 verse 8 tells us? That God commended his love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that the gospel that even at your worst, he saw you and loved you? Even when you didn't love him, even when there wasn't anything lovable about you, he still loved you. That is the gospel. And she goes and tells people, you've got to come see this man. She stood up and walked away without the water pot. Because she had the whole well. See, Jesus, if you look at the very beginning, it just started with a conversation about water. Give me something to drink. You don't have a bucket. You're right. But let me tell you about some living water. And he took the lesser, lower, and lighter and made it into the heavier, higher, and holier. Then he spent some time talking with her, hearing her, listening to her understanding her concerns and says, you know what? Anything I know about you doesn't scare me away. I love you. Here's some living water. You want it? All you got to do is take it. 